Hi, everyone. Welcome to our discussion on prefab and construction needs um, today. Our guest speaker today is Jared Christman, who is the owner of VidCAD Solutions. He has spent more than 20 years in the electrical construction industry, and he was recently awarded NECA's 2022 MAP Innovator of the Year Award for his contributions in educating and furthering innovation through the community. Thanks so much for joining us today, Jared. Thank you for having me, Kim. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I've spent the past 20 years, 25 years in my career uh, in the electrical field. Uh, I had started right out of trade school where I had wanted to become a, a draftsman or a pencil draftsman is what we were called um, until I started failing all of my drafting classes. So I traded the pencil for a mouse and off I went. Um, I've done everything from a GIS uh, utility survey crew chief, MEP designer, and as of late, 10 years in the past, uh, in the BIM and VDC uh, manager position. Well, we are really excited to have you today. Um, Jared will be taking us through his prefab journey. He will talk about why and how he got started in prefab, what challenges he faced along the way, how he overcame them, and he'll give us tips and best practices on how to best leverage prefab. We will have a Q&A throughout today's discussion using the Q&A feature. So please enter any questions you have using that button at the bottom of your screen. Note that this, this discuss, discussion is being recorded. So any questions that we are not able to address today will be answered and emailed out along with the link to the recording following the webinar. So just please make sure you have the right email registered. With all that said, Jared, shall we get started? Absolutely. Great. Jared, you're about to share a video with us that during your time with Big State, you helped DeWalt put together an electrical rack from model to assembly. Before we start that video, can you just give us an, a hell of an overview of what we're about to watch? Sure. So what this is, is this is the electrical portion of a multi-trade rack. Um, some of the things that we're going to focus on in this video are, are items that we have implemented in the prefab process, uh, standardized conduit spacing, uh, standardized location and sizing of boxes. Um, you know, I can't say standardized location of, of all of the items because we do coordinate, but during our coordination, we try to, to really keep in mind the coordination process of the mechanical guys as well, giving them access zones to their, to their valves and stuff that they need as well. So that's that multi-trade uh, aspect of it. Uh, but some of the, or actually all of these items that you're going to see in this video are things that are discussed throughout this webinar. Great. Let's check out the video. So starting off right off the bat, if you take away the legs because it was for a display and just focus on the upper portion, that is the actual uh, electrical uh, assembly portion of that rack. So um, as these pieces and parts are coming in together here, you can really focus on the, the standardized spacing of the conduits. And what that does is that really helps us uh, be able to standardize the process, right? So we have jigs and we have spacing uh, inserts that we put to give us that standardized spacing to where the guys in the shop don't even really need to measure that at this point. Uh, some of the other aspects you're looking at is the, the location of those boxes. You know, we try to standardize around that as well as the size. And what we take into consideration is using those boxes as an exit to get out of our rack, as opposed to having to offset each time that we wanna get out of that rack uh, at a lower elevation. So you notice we're using the top part of that assembly to mount the, the conduit to. So we're kind of using that as our first means of support, uh, which code requires, as well as the cable tray locations. Great. So I'm just curious because you mentioned um, through standardization or also some time and not having to measure. Was it? Did you? Do you know how long that took versus how long it would have taken if you had not done it through BIM? Well, we we we've, we've trimmed considerable time using the pre-planning and the prefabrication process. Um, you know, some of the the aspects of standardization. You know, the conduit spacing is one, and using those jigs. Anytime that you don't have to pull out a tape measure to measure specific items and you have that spacing that's automatically given to you, it's going gonna, it's gonna to trim off that time. So uh, without specific numbers, because every job is a little different, it, it does take considerable time off of that assembly process. Great. 
so you know this video is a great example of of what pre, pre, what prefab can be. But you know we know there are just so many different elements of prefab. It could be something as simple as you know cutting and kitting, or as comprehensive as a full assembly. I would like to take pause for just a minute um, and take a quick poll from our listeners to better understand you know, where they are today in leveraging prefab. So for all of those of you who are on the call via video, you should see a poll pop up on your screen here shortly. You could just take a minute to answer the questions and that apply to you. And then we will use that to kind of better um, tailor this conversation today. Great, just take another moment and then we will share those results. All right, another few seconds and let's see what we have here. 30 more seconds. I say, let's go ahead and wrap up the poll and see where we're at. Great. So it looks like we have a, quite a bit of mix of, um, of people leveraging prefab. Some are just are just doing the basic things of pre-cut length. Some are actually already doing full assemblies. That's great too, about 29%. And then it looks like half the group here is also here just to listen and learn more about prefab. So that's awesome. So this will be really helpful for us today as we go through um, into your questions and everything to kind of help tailor those questions and those answers, right, Jared? Perfect. So um, yeah, you know, the thing about prefab is we've heard it's it's a growing topic. We've, we've heard it over the years, but some would say it's a little bit slower of a method that's been adopted. So in your opinion, why do you think that is? And, and why do you think the topic of prefab is so important? Well, on the on the uh, the adoption aspect of it, um, I think that companies are kind of reluctant to take that dive um, because of the the trust, you know, in the coordination process with uh, the other trades, um, as well as the uh, the ability to to really optimize the layout of your prefab and as it gets put into the field, um, I think some of that comes with you know just the trust of your your installation, the trust of your BIM modeling. And for us, that's where we really focused uh, our, our, our aspect was the, the pre-planning side. You know, we made sure that we modeled it and the, exactly like it was gonna be installed. And what that did for us is that gave us confidence, that gave us trust that we could go out there and we could install these racks within a half inch of where they were modeled um, using the, the, the Trimble Pro, the point layout process that also was considerable um, in 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 finding our points and locating those points and carrying those over into our model. Um, so why do I think it's important? I, th there's as you gain trust in your prefab process, you can start to open up more doors. You can start to incorporate more processes into that prefab. You can start with, you know, small devices, you know, uh, in wall and MC and lighting whips and MC, and you can build your way up step-by-step step to these pre-assembled racks that are going out in sections and snapped into place out in the field. So we actually do have a question um, from one of our listeners. Can you speak to the prefab world before BIM and BDC? Um, he says, imagine prefab existed before or at least separately before it was supercharged at BIM and BDC. Can you give a little more color on that? Sure, sure. So like for, uh, for our process, we started with, with in-wall, right? We would take the in-wall devices and we would put 20 to 25 feet of MC coiled up inside of there along with all of the connectors, um, you know, and, and we would send those out, you know, as a prefab kit or assembly, very basic assembly. And what we would do is that 20 to 25 feet would, would basically cover most of the uh, issues that we would have in the field, moving up and down around objects in the wall, stuff like that. Um, lighting whips was another thing. One of the first, those are the first two things that we brought into our shop to start prefabbing. Uh, lighting whips were pretty easy. You could coil up the tails and, you know, tie, zip tie them to the light and send them out in the field. Um, as we started processing um, 
or going through the modeling aspect of it, we started to incorporate that in wall. We could see where our next device was. We could see if there were any other uh, issues, items we were going to have to move around windows, um, you know, specifically uh, stuff like that. So we, um, once we incorporated the model, we took that 20 to 25 foot, you know, uh, a blanket length. And we started to actually just say, you know what, let's add, you know, 15% on top of whatever is in the model as just a little bit of fluff. But yeah, before the, before the BIM process, there was, you know, it, it, what we were using prefab and we were using prefab assemblies. It was just a little more rudimentary. Okay. And that actually um, is a great segue into what I was about to ask you. You know, I think we've all heard of the suggested benefits of prefab, right? And what it can offer. I would love to hear, and I'm sure others would too, what benefits you have you have personally seen and achieved le since leveraging prefab? And then as we go through your journey today of the challenges you face, we can kind of get a better understanding of everything you went through to get to those results. So can you just share some of those benefits with us? Absolutely. Uh, so the first example is um, an electrical room layout that we had standardized. And what we had done is we had made specific uh, intentions to prefab all of these electrical rooms. And this was for a high rise building. And, and ultimately what we were able to do is prefab each one of these sections. And in the, in the pictures, you can see how they're kind of sectionalized. That was so that we could get them into that room. Um, this was a core and shell finish out. We were doing the finish out. So we had to break these pieces up and get them into the room, but ultimately they were all the same. Uh, we were able to bring them in uh, every one of these rooms. We tried to lay out as similar as possible. There were minor differences, but not much. And, and ultimately, this saved us considerable time and labor hours in the process. Um, on this next image, you're going to see the, uh, the installation of, the act of an electrical room. And this is um, not for that high rise, but this is a typical installation. On the left, you're going to see what was modeled. And you'll see those black lines right above that panel rack. Those are the couplings for the conduit. You go to the center image our shop drawing that what's that's what goes out to the field to be built i'm sorry to the shop to be built and again you can see that very definitive line um in that middle left image right there that plan that uh, section view of those panels you can see that very definitive line that is the coupling lines now you go to the far right hand side and that's what was installed again if you look closely you can see those couplings right above that pre-assembled rack well what we were able to do is we were able to take that whole assembly lean it up against the wall and mount it all in one piece. Uh, and then from that point, you can see how the assembled, the pre-assembled uh, racks were able to connect there and then go on out through the rest of the building. And then on this next image, you're gonna see an example of the racks themselves or the assemblies themselves. This is utilizing that, that standardized spacing that I was talking about during that video. So that's where you're seeing these, all of these conduit are spaced the exact same. So we were able to, to use a jig and basically put these conduit into a, a, a very a specified uh, gapping jig. And that way we didn't have to measure from center of conduit to center of conduit. We also had standardized lengths between the unistrut, which, you know, again, the standardization is key for prefab because the more standardized that your, your process is, then the less thought goes into those very uh, mundane aspects. You know, your spacing of your, your strut and the spacing of your conduit racks. So, um, and then on this final image, this is a pre-assembled uh, underground assembly. And what's important about this one is this is one of the, this was a project that um, one of those rare uh, Texas summers where we got considerable rain and the, they kept having to close down the job site due to flooding of the trenches and just flooding of the site in general. So as opposed to us just pulling off the electricians and having them idle, what we did is we brought them all into the prefab shop. Um, they built these assemblies based off of our model and based off of our shop drawings. They built these assemblies there um, at our shop. We stored them in the parking lot until that job site opened back up. As soon as the job site opened back up, we were able to take these pre-assembled underground assemblies, load them up on a truck, get them out to the job site, and, and put them into the trenches. And we were, we were caught up to schedule considerably quicker as opposed to building it on site. And ultimately we ended up saving approximately 16 days um, off of that delayed uh, schedule. Great, so a, a few questions from our listeners from what, just what you just talked about. What happens when a wall is built where an open space is shown? Well, that is, uh, that is one of those that, uh, 
you're always going to have little hiccups, right? Especially when it comes to the general contractors and the, um, the sheetrock guys and everyone working together. Someone's working off of an older design or older plan. Um, in a situation like that, what we would do is we would have to RFI that, you know, get the superintendents involved, get them to clarify exactly what happened. Now, with utilizing the BIM process, if that happens, you have a little bit of leeway to go back to the general contractor and say, hey, look, in the model that we designed off of and that we coordinated to, that wall was located there or that wall was not located there. And it gives you a little bit of, uh, you know, of ground to stand on when you come and ask them, you know, and, 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 and talk to them about change order or how we're going to ultimately fix that issue. So if there are changes that are done on a job site, um, are they reflected in the model afterwards if they were not done according to the BIM model? Theoretically, they're supposed to be. They're supposed to be an as-built BIM model. And that's the one that's going to go on to the general contractor as they're as-built, which will eventually be passed on to the owner and to the facilities maintenance. Uh, that is one of those things that um, if you were to ask me any aspect of the trade of the BIM world that needs to be improved on, that would probably be the one. Um, that process tends to get overlooked. Um, but for facilities maintenance to really, really utilize that model, um, you know, you've got to have an accurate as-built condition. Sure. Um, and also, I'm just curious, because you mentioned um, your schedule and how rain affected um, your project, and it was, it, was a, it was quite an obstacle, something that you can control, right? So what other obstacles, whether they were uncontrollable or not, uh, were you able to overcome with prefab? Um, well, there's a number of obstacles. So scheduling is going to be one of the big ones. Um, the, you know, like this project that we're, we're looking at right here, this was a, uh, we're going to call it less than optimal uh, starting point for our prefab assembly journey. Um, this was a renovation of an older building. Um, we really, this was, we were very beginning on this. Um, we didn't have any idea of, of logistics. We weren't, we didn't know any better than to not involve the field. So we did this on our own, sent it out to the field, told them, Hey, look, this is how we want you to build it. Um, you, there, the, the software really wasn't there yet. You know, we were using AutoCAD as opposed to Revit, which we're using now. So ultimately all things considered this was that the bottom two images are, was just an absolute failure. Um, you know, the, the form and it frustrated the field guys, which then in turn, uh, you know, made us step back and rethink our process. Well, you, you, these failures, we didn't just walk away from them and say, you know, throw our hands in the air and say, you know what, we're, that's it. We're not doing it anymore. We, we did a lessons learned. We sat down, we evaluated our workflow. We evaluated, evaluated our process and we modified it. So the top images, the top two shop drawings, you can look at and you can see they're, they're resemble, they resemble the bottom ones. The difference is, is field involvement. We had the, the field foreman come in they sat with us. We talked about the routing. We involved them in the design. Um, the software, we were using Revit. We were able to embed a lot more information into our conduit and into our assemblies. Um, and the logistics, um, instead of sending a whole job or a whole level out like we did on the bottom two, now we send them out in very small areas. And that would be one of the things that, that was one of our big lessons learned. We, we sent out in a very small area. They installed it. We came back, there were some issues that we needed to tweak. So we went back and we talked about, okay, let, what can we do better on the next one? And being able to control the size of each one of your shipments or your deliveries, your what we call kitted areas, um, it really, you can, you can control the effect of your failures or adjustments at that point. So the top one now, you can see they're pretty close. You know, they, they resemble the bottom ones. Top one, total success and the field guys love it. You know, I, I think it's fair to say that it can be very discouraging to face so many challenges early on, right? I mean, you talk about, in your words, huge failures. <laughs> so, you know, how, how did you stay motivated to keep pushing forward and avoid that temptation of just going back to doing what you're used to doing? You know, you really have to look at it in a challenge, right? Every time we would have um, something that was less successful than something else, right? The, the, those failures, we would sit, we would take a step back and say, you know what? How can we make this better? This failure challenges me 
you know, to make this process better. So ultimately what we would do is we would, uh, we would have meetings, we would talk about it, we would just, you know, stay encouraged. And, and eventually what happens is, is after you push through those failures enough, you really start to gain momentum on the successes. And those, those, those failures are, are smaller tidbits of your whole process. But, you know, just remember that those big failures are basically the, the building block and the foundation of your process. Yeah, so then that, if you could just give one piece of advice to those who are about to take their first step into prefab, what, what advice would you give them? Um, probably the biggest piece of advice I would say is when you really start to think that, that your, your process is not working out and you feel like this is a failure and you're just you know one step away from throwing up your hands and walking out and say, you know what, this prefab is, is just not for us. When you get to that point, just push a little bit further because you're probably a lot closer than you think to pushing through that wall and making it a success. Don't give up. You know, it, it, we all fail. You know, every one of us is, have done it. Don't be afraid of those failures. Embrace them and learn from them. So a question um, from one of our listeners is who decides and or determines what the construction team is standardizing in a prefab? Example, your conduit spacing. Who decides that? So when ultimately when it comes to who decides what level of prefab, GC involvement is important, right? During our BIM kickoff meeting, um, during the pre-planning meetings, we make sure that the GC understands, um, you know, what level of prefab we're going to be doing and how it affects the job site. And depending on, and, you know, look, going back to the poll, depending on your level of prefab, if you've got a, a, a good prefab shop, that's, that's really uh, prefabbing a lot of your content to be installed. Don't hesitate to get the GC and not just the, the, the suits, you know, not just the upper management of the GC, but the superintendents, the guys that are going to be on the job site, get them in tour your shop and explain to them how important it is that that prefab is a success because ultimately they want you to be as successful as you want to be. Prefab helps out the whole project. Get them in, tour the shop, explain to them the importance of your prefab, explain to them how, how trades not following the model affects your prefab or negatively affects your prefab and just make sure they understand that. And, and, and really uh, nine times out of 10, you'll have their support. So, you know, you mentioned one of the big tips is really mindset, right? Just getting in with the right mindset, stay motivated. Um, what tip would you give or advice would you give to someone who's starting out that's like actionable in terms of like, okay, if I'm ready to actually take that first step, we're ready, our mind's in the game, we are going full forward for it. What would you say would be your, um, your, your tip there? So um, one of the first things that I, I feel, and we've probably made the biggest um, uh, improvement in our process. And, and I'm going to, I'm going to switch gears towards the modeling side of it. Right. Because for really for, for large prefabbing, that's going to be your, your big success is going to be when you involve the model, um, bringing in the electricians, right. Get the actual guys that are the electricians. Uh, we had two, uh, that were, you know, 30, 35 year electricians, you know, they'd been in the field a long time. They knew the trades. Uh, we brought them in, we trained them in the software and, and that was where we made our shift from BIM, which is spatial coordination to VDC, which is virtual uh, design construction. So once we got those guys in, they were physically building that job in the model, just like they would build it out in the field. And that was one of the biggest keys uh, to our prefab success, get them in, get them trained and, and get them to really start virtually building the job. Um, the next thing would be uh, foreman involvement, get the field in, right? Have those field guys come in because having them being involved in the process, um, it really brings together more of a teamwork mentality as opposed to the office doing a design and giving it to the team, telling them, this is how you're gonna build it. Um, electricians are, you know, they take pride in their work you know, get them involved, have that layout and that design become a team issue to where it's the guys in the office plus the guys in the field. Doing that, the guys in the field knowing and feeling that they're involved in their design is that they're going to be more willing to follow your layout. And, and really, it's just the whole camaraderie shit. And then probably the third thing that's going to be a, a big improvement um, is going to be meetings. You know, don't be afraid to meet weekly, right? Have weekly meetings talking about things that are going on um, on the project. Um, again, facing that, you know, going back to the camaraderie ship, 
you know, the, the more time you, the office and the field guys are working together, the more camaraderie ship there's going to be, you know, there may be days where you're not doing a lot of talking, you know, maybe you only talk about your project for five or 10 minutes and you spend another five or 10 minutes talking about fantasy football. Right. And, and you think that's a waste of time. <laughs> and you, you know, you think that's a waste of time. And, you know, if it gets carried away, it can be. But that additional five to 10 minutes of just extra time of talking one on one, as opposed to being friends, as opposed to being a foreman and a VDC guy goes a long ways. It really does. So you, you had an interesting approach. You mentioned you brought in people from the field who had 30 to 35 years of experience. Right. So I can only imagine um, your productivity on, on, on the job site. Right. So. I imagine there is some fear about bringing those people in and how that will actually affect your job site productivity. Can you just give us a little more information on that? And, you know, just also um, better understand these people are coming in a field that you're training on BIM BDC. What did that process look like? And, you know, what was their experience and how did they get there? And how did you get them up to speed? So um, the first aspect, you know, it was a hard pill to swallow, right? You're, you're bringing in probably your top two guys uh, in our case. Um, it was the top two guys we had, uh, one that specialized in distribution, which uh, we quantify as everything that comes to a panel or, you know, that is a large pipe, you know, a large voltage, high voltage distribution. Well, we brought in one of those guys. He was a, this, a specialist. He, he w- would go to, you know, uh, that was the go-to guy when you had questions. We brought him in. We had another guy that was, had been doing a layout for branch. Uh, which is any of the pipe that leaves the 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 panels um he was he was a master at what he did so we brought him in those two guys leaving the field and coming into the office everyone couldn't believe we were doing that you know you're taking the top two guys but what we found is that those guys uh in a year would be on one job right they would spend a, a year on a job you know that some of these go even longer but bringing them into the office, that same, those same two guys and the talents they have could now affect four jobs, six jobs, you know, in the pre-planning side. And, and it didn't take us long to realize that as opposed to them just spending all of their talent and all of their um, uh, expertise on one job and them spreading it out through across, across multiple jobs, the, it, it helped the entire company. And what it did is you saw some of these, uh, the younger guys that stepped up to take their position, you know, that, that stepped up to learn their expertise and, and, and take their place in that expertise. And what it did is it exponentially got better, right? We took one, brought them into the office. It produced three more in the field that stepped up, that took that responsibility. Now we had three guys that were just as good, eventually got just as good as that one. So um, th- that was a big, that was a tough pill to swallow, but it did, you know, it, it, it more than uh, paid its dividends. Um, <laughs> So coming back to the second part of the question, how did we get there? Um, Ultimately, uh, these guys were, you know, one of them had already had some um, AutoCAD experience uh, from, you know, earlier on his career. Uh, The other one had some really strong PDF, uh, you know, Bluebeam experience. Uh, So they were already a little, you know, I'm not going to say 100% technology savvy, but they were opened up to it, right? Uh, They were willing to learn. And that was one of the things that also, you know, keyed us to bring them in. Um, They were willing to learn the software. So we taught them. It was, um, you know, it took a little bit of of training. We're going to say three months, right? But, but, you know, it was a work in progress. It's not like they were just 100% in training. We would, you know, after about the second week, they were able to start producing some of the Revit um, items and, and starting to draw and coordinate by three months, you know, I would, I would say they were at 50% capability by, uh, by the end of the year, they were in full production. You know, they would still come and ask very specific questions on the Revit, but for the most part, um, they were, they were really, uh, self-sufficient. And this comes into that aspect of having the, you know, your electricians, but you've got to have one guy who is the champion of the software, right? He's the guy that knows the Revit. He's the guy that knows the Navis works. He knows how to use it. And it gives them a point of contact for any technology related questions. So that was kind of how we handled that process. That's great. I mean, three months can, you know, 50% after speed. I mean, that's, that's, that's great. Um, A question from our listener, how do you deal with changing specs, architectural plans, submittal design changes, um, after all that upfront hours to get the, the things to this level of detail? So you, if, if, kind of open-ended. So I'm going to handle this in two different 
um, answers. So the first answer is the changes during the VIM process, right? You are constantly having changes. Um, you know, the, uh, especially nowadays, you're starting to see the BIM process start with 65% drawings, 85% drawings, and, and we're having, you know, we're trying to coordinate and they're doing, they're changing things. Um, one of the things that we try to incorporate is, is during that kickoff meeting, make a very specific line in the sand. At this point, we're coordinating as soon as we sign off what's called, uh, you know, model sign off. That's where we're done coordinating. Everyone is clear and we're getting ready to release the shop drawings out to be built. At that sign off point, that is the end of coordination for that area. So you sign off, that area is done. Any changes that happen after that, there needs to be some cost associated with that. Um, sometimes it's a little bit of a diff difficult discussion to have with the GC, but if you bring it up up front and let them know, they'll be a little more uh, reluctant to push that sign off process because that's what they're gonna wanna do. They're wanna, they wanna just push it and push it for a check the box. Well, anyone who's doing prefab and utilizing their model for prefab realizes that to us, that's not just a check the box. This is the, this is the backbone of our entire process. Um, so, so with that aspect, you know, before coordination or during coordination, that's how we handle it. Now, let's fast forward. So now your coordination is done, your shop drawings are done, you've got your, your prefabrication is completed that's starting to head out to the field and you're getting the architect that's saying, oh, you know what? I wanna move this wall six inches because it's blocking the sun into this office, you know, something like that, right? So something that the architect thinks is important, but it really doesn't, you know, the only thing it does for us is affect how we're laying out. Um, in those situations, you just have to explain, you know, to the, and this is where it comes back to making sure that the, the GC has toured your shop, understands the implications of those things happening and how it, affects your prefab, you just have to explain to them, look, I will, the architect wants to change this. He wants me to move my rack over six inches to accommodate this wall. There's going to be a cost implied. We're going to have to take that prefab assembly out. We're going to have to get it back to the shop. We're going to have to re redo or, or, or field bin those pipes, in which case field bending is going to take longer. And there just has to be a cost applied to that. That makes sense. I mean, way to push collaboration and accountability, right? Um, another another question from our listeners: How do you express the BIM model to the field crew? Example being two D drawings or three D files, and what would be the best way, in your opinion? Um, so, you you are always going to have your two D right, whether it be PDF or whether it be um, hard copies. Um, and now, to get the three D model, there's a couple of ways: um, three sixty glue and the iPad. Um, you know, using that iPad on the 360 glue, what we did, we used um, Bluebeam View as our cloud storage, right? A Bluebeam has a capabilities called, or an item in there called projects that basically acts as cloud storage. And uh, a Bluebeam View, I think was like $5 a month for the iPad, if I remember right. But ultimately what it would do, it was give us an avenue to upload from our office to the Bluebeam cloud. And then that would sync to the Bluebeam on the iPad. The guys on the iPad would click it, open it up and be able to use, view the model, walk through the model in, on the iPad. So that's one way. The, another way is the Surface, you know, the, using the new Microsoft Surfaces. Um, getting those using Dropbox or OneDrive or any of the number of cloud storages, using those, those, uh, that cloud storage, upload the model to the cloud, make sure it syncs to the guys in the field. And at that point, they can maneuver around in the model as well. And then a, another option, is uh, the smart gang boxes. You know, they have these gang boxes now that you can put a monitor in it. You can um, have electrical connections in it. You can plug in your surface. We even had a printer in ours. And that would basically be on the job site and it would move around on levels, but it would give the guys a central place to go to to view the model. Um, now, all three of those are ways to access the model. Now let's talk really quick on data in the model. Using a, and I'm gonna speak with what I know, which is the Revit side. So using Revit, you can export out your 3D models. And there's a couple of settings in there that you can check inside of Revit that it will export out all of your parameters, right? So when you export out your 3D model, you export out your parameters, the guys in the field get it using Navisworks. They can now click on a piece of pipe and it'll give them system. It'll give them elevation. It'll give them circuiting information. It, it Pretty much whatever you put in in Revit, gets translated to the guys in the field. So you're looking at a 2D shop drawing, you see, you're seeing 2D pipe, you have your model next to it. You can see a piece of conduit on the 2D, you can click it in the model. It'll tell you if it's 
branch, emergency branch, lighting, tell you that it's 10 foot four inches off of the floor. It'll tell you that it's, you know, panel LA circuits 135. You know, it's got all this information embedded into that 3D object. So using two of them in tandem, absolutely the best way to get 100% of that data that's from the model to the guys in the field. Um, another question from our listeners, how would you go about starting at adding detailing? So the adding detailing, well, depends on what kind of detailing you're talking about. The, there's the detailing, which is the details in your model, or there's the detailing um, of your shop drawings and the detail that's in your 2D plan. Um, both aspects, I think, are going to be putting the right guys in the seats, right? So you have make sure that the guys who are doing the detailing understand what they're detailing. Um, if it's going to be on the model side, um, if it's going to be on the dimensioning and the shop drawing side, make sure that the guys that are doing the dimensioning and the detailing know what they're dimensioning, know that know what the guys in the field need, because there's a lot of, you can throw dimensions up on a drawing all day long. And if it's not anything that the field needs, it's not going to do any good. Make sure they understand what the guys in the field want. Make sure they understand what they're dimensioning. Great. So um, it sounds like just to, to recap some of the, the the best practices or even just tips and tricks you're mentioning is one, you definitely need upper management support, make sure you get their buy-in. Field participation sounds like it's a, it's a big one, bringing in some of your best guys in the field, even though it may be painful to start. Um, it sounds like, you know, with the right training programs, getting the right people in place, they can really expedite and um, 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 help you with the success of, of prefab overall. And of course, you said just overall, the internal collaboration. Um, you know, we talked a lot about what you can do um, individually as a company, but let's talk about more about the cross trade side, right? And that's working with other trades. And so um, uh, one question we had from one of our listeners is, um, have you seen other, uh, sorry, are the trades collaborating with prefab? For example, are you seeing any mechanical and electrical companies prefabbing in the same shop? Um, so this, that's interesting because, um, that rack we were looking at at the beginning, um, there's an, uh, another portion of that on there, which is the mechanical aspect. Right. Mm -hmm. And, um, so it's a challenge to, to get a sheet metal worker into an electrical shop and vice versa. It's, you know, um, uh, there's just, you know, there, there's union issues, there's insurance issues, you know, but that being said, if you have a great relationship with the mechanical contractor or the mechanical trades, work together, right? Like, so on some of our better uh, mechanical contractors, um, the ones that we were planning on prefabbing together or, or taking into account our layouts, we would have our normal BIM coordination meetings. But before that or after that, depending on, we would have our own internal you know, trades coordination meetings, which we're not talking about clashes. We're not talking about RFIs. Mm -hmm. You know, we're talking about how is your assembly and your layout going to affect my assembly and my layout. And we would work together, you know, and, and that's ultimately the goal, right? Is, is all of the trades, the mechanical, electrical, plumbing, and the fire guys, you know, we all want the same thing, a successful project that is ultimately we're making money on. And the best way to do that is to work together as a team. And, and to really, you know, the best way to work together as a team, get away from the GC, have your own coordination meetings, you know, work together, take into consideration each other's layouts, as opposed to, to being, uh, you know, more forceful on, I cannot move, I have to stay in this spot. Well, we can all move a little bit. Let's work together and let's make it a successful prefab project. Yeah, so I imagine, you know, on these projects, you're having different, the trades have different levels of, you know, in regards to how advanced they are in prefab. So do you ever come into issues where um, they're not as advanced and therefore it hinders your productivity? Or, you know, how do you, how do you combat that to, to not affect your schedule? Sure. So you are always going to have um, general contractors, uh, mechanical plumbers. And if you're a mechanical or a plumber, you know, an electrical contractor who's a little weaker or a little less advanced than you are um, in, in the BIM process or the prefab process for that matter. Um, again, using that teamwork mentality, don't be afraid to pick those guys up and help them out. Uh, you know, we're all working together. Hey, Mr. Mechanical Guy, you guys are just starting in Revit. Hey, let me help you out. Let me volunteer a little bit of my time and, and help you out on your Revit journey, your Revit process, and see if we can't work together. And, and, and I would be lying if I said it didn't put me behind schedule on other jobs, right? 
But in my opinion, um, that time invested and that relationship you're building definitely pays dividends throughout the project. You know, work together, build those guys up. And ultimately it's going to help the entire project out. Same goes for the GC. There are there were GCs that were running meetings and coordination meetings and, and using Navisworks that were still, um, you know, fairly new in that coordination process. Well, I would get offline and get with those guys and I'd explain to them, hey, look, try using this process to run your clash reports. Uh, when when submitting your clash reports, try using this process, you know, or, you know, using the this color appearance when you're setting up your BIM models. Um, but really the those relationships are relationships that you are going to continue. You know, the, the construction world is not as big as we all think, right? So especially no, if you, <laughs> especially if you work in a in your city, right? And you're 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 in like, you're you've got a very specific area. Those relationships that you're building with those people, you're going to be working with those guys for the next five, 10, 15 years. You know, that that is those are key relationships, and and you really get to be known as the, uh, you know, the guy that supports the teamwork, and and you know, ultimately when. When we all succeed as a team, the project succeeds. Yeah, absolutely. So to go back to um, you know talking about internally and, and you know field participation and, and um, the collaboration among teams, one listener asks, would it be more efficient in your opinion to have a crew member on each site who is proficient in VDC, or for each member to have a basic understanding of the software? Well, you know, you could have. You could have one. Starting out, it's probably a good idea to have at least one, right, on the on the job site that is familiar with the VDC. And, and ultimately, you're not going to have every one of your guys is going to have an iPad or not every one of them is going to have a Surface, you know. Um, those are going to be for your foreman, you know, your general foreman. Um, but starting with at least one guy on there is, is a great start. Now, what happens if your guy is a seasoned veteran construction guy, you know, electrician, mechanical, whatever. One of our biggest challenges was to explain to those guys that that iPad is not used to hold papers from blowing off of your desk, right? So, um, you know, some of these guys, they get this technology, they don't know what to do with it. Team them up with a younger guy who is familiar with the technology, maybe not as strong on the trades. Team him up with a guy who is strong in the trade and not necessarily strong in technology and have them work together and teach each other. And what with us doing that, what we saw was that foreman developed a great relationship with the younger guy and they would work together from job to job. They would go from job to job. And, and ultimately um, what would happen was you would see the older guy embrace the technology, the younger guy know enough about the trade to where he would get awarded his own job and he would become a foreman on his own. So it was really a, a, a building block for, you know, the, the technology to spread across the company. That's great, love that. Um, so you talked about where you started, you talked about quite a few challenges along the way, how you overcame them. So two questions, let's talk about what's next for you and where do you believe the future of either prefab or just the industry is going next? So, you know, the, let's go back to that question, right? That they had asked about the mechanical and the electrical working together in the same shop, right? Yeah. So what I think, and the people that I've talked to in the industry, I believe this is going to be something that's really going to be happening sooner than later, that you're going to be able to use augmented reality, AR, hollow lenses, um, you know, the Trimble, the XR10, which is the hollow lens built into the hard hat. Um, you'll be able to utilize that in your shop and you'll be able to, to build as an electrician, your electrical prefab components, your assembly, seeing the mechanicals augmented reality model above you. So you would literally be able to build your electrical rack, knowing exactly where the mechanical ductwork piping is all located and vice versa. They'll be at their shop building their mechanical, seeing exactly where your electrical rack is. Again, the backbone of that is your model. You got to have an accurate model to really make that work. But when you have the trust and the teamwork between the trades, you will get there. Um, Another thing that is, is absolutely coming is, and I'm sure people have seen it, is robotics. Um, you know, you've got the, uh, the Trimble Spot that is coming. Um, you know, I think that you're going to be able to see that spot walk a job site at night when there's no one there. It will scan the existing conditions, what was installed that day. 
give you a good point cloud, um, upload that point cloud uh, to the cloud uh, to where I come in in the morning, I log into my computer, the point cloud is then synced to my computer, I can load it into my model and I can verify if the, the installations match the model. I can see if there's gonna be an issue with ductwork that wasn't installed per the model and it's gonna interfere with my conduit rack before my conduit racks ever hit the floor. So those are just some things I think that are coming. And, you know, um, technology is one of those things you can't really fight. You know, you're going to have to just learn to roll with it and, and implement it and don't be afraid. Absolutely. Um, a couple of final questions from our listeners to wrap up. How do you deal with overhead rack locations being affected by pandemic corrugation and the need to meet minimum anchor embedments? Okay. So what, that is a great question. And that was one of our big hurdles. What we had found, and you're going to pardon me, you're going to have to look it up. Um, there are items that are sold. Um, I believe DeWalt has some um, that are spanners. And basically what it is, is it is an anchor point that has a big T across the top of it that will span that corrugation. So now you can actually control your points 100% regardless of corrugation. Um, so Though, and, 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 and you, you know, again, when we come back and put comments in, we'll put that part number on there for everyone to, re to uh, reference. Uh, but that is one. And, and hand in hand with that, yeah, they haven't mentioned it, but it goes hand in hand is the location of bar joists. How do you control your points when you've got bar joist placement and the uh, structural steel guys aren't following uh, their own shop drawings? Um, what we do for that is we use our trimble. We will go out there, we will do a point cloud, a scan a point cloud. Uh, we will identify exactly where those uh, joist locations are. We'll bring them into our Revit model and we will adjust our anchor and point locations to the actual existing joist locations. And then final question, have you experimented with modular bathroom pods and working with other trades in a shared space? And if so, what were your takeaways? I have not. And that is a great question because I think that's another thing that is coming is these, and not only modular bathroom pods, but modular pods in general, be, be it electrical rooms. I know we've seen modular electric rooms, um, none that we've actually worked with. Um, but I think that that is a great, great concept. I think that it's something that will absolutely um, improve a schedule. Um, again, from what I do know about those, some of the things to take into consideration is the flexibility of the, the trade connections from where it leaves the pod to where it, it connects to the main system, be it mechanical, electrical, or plumbing, making sure that those points are, are, are really accurate or that there's some form of flexible connection there that you can connect those two points. Yeah, and I think we actually do have time for maybe one or two more questions. So um, one other question we have from listener is, let's say you're running copper. How do you address when the assembly, assembly quality is off and doesn't fit how it was originally designed to? Can this be addressed or planned for in the prefab process? Well, it's getting kind of out of my wheelhouse when it comes to the copper aspect. Um, yeah. But um, in in general speaking, when it comes to the prefab process and the quality, um, really the, the amount of pre-planning um, and field verification, if, if, if that's what it requires, right? But ultimately making sure that that prefab is, is what, whatever trade it is, making sure that it is accurate to what is, exact, what is in the existing conditions uh, in the field. Um, if those are fluid, if there are things that are still changing and you're trying to prefab during those changes, maybe wait until those changes settle a little before you actually start implementing your prefab. Make sure you don't put the cart before the horse. Great tip. Well, um, Jerry, I know we're getting close to time. So, you know, once again, we appreciate you sharing your journey and letting us pick your brain on prefab and just other questions in the construction industry. Um, do you have any parting words for us after all that? What should we, if we take anything away from the last 50 minutes, what should it be? Um, I think probably the best piece of advice that I would give, um, don't be afraid of failing, right? You're, you know, your failures are, uh, if, if learned from, is not a failure. It's a lesson, right? Don't be afraid to fail. Let those failures 
be your foundation and your building blocks for your successes. Um, at the point to where when you think that you are just at the end of the rope, you know, you failed, you failed, you're having a hard time, you're ready to throw your hands up and storm out of the office. At that point, don't give up. Keep going. You're probably the closest you have been so far to making that prefab or that process a success. Keep on going, through, push through those failures, push through that wall and come out the other side smiling. Great. Well, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Um, for everyone, that does wrap up our discussion for today. Um, once again, Jared, for your for sharing your time and your story, letting us um, just have this discussion. For more information on prefabrication or for any additional questions that we may be able to answer, please visit the website or you can contact us via email. We will also send out this contact information in an email following the webinar, along with any questions we may have missed and a link to the recording itself. So everyone on behalf of DeWalt, thank you all again for joining us. Have a great one. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jared.